Hello, I am James Sutherland, and I am a fourth year PhD student at the University of Maryland in the Aerospace Engineering Department. And my research focuses on helicopter and tilt rotor dynamics in flight. Um, today, I wanted to share my work on the design and modeling of advanced geometry composite prop rotor blades. So the first question to answer is, what is a prop rotor? Well, it's a combination of a propeller and a rotor. A propeller is used to generate thrust for an aircraft and is typically rigid with a fixed pitch. Since it's always an axial flow, that is the air is moving down onto the disc, a large amount of the blade twist, or a large amount of blade twist is optimal. A rotor, on the other hand, provides lift, thrust, and control over the helicopter. The blades are very flexible and controlled with cyclic oscillations of the pitch. In forward flight, the air blows over the edge of the disc, which leads to a low twist design. A prop rotor is used on tilt rotors and operates in helicopter and airplane mode and everything in between. Because of that, it has to be flexible with cyclic pitch control, but still highly twisted to accommodate a variety of flow conditions. So why use a tilt rotor if you have to compromise between a propeller and a rotor to do the same job? Five years ago, the only flying tilt rotor was the B-22 Osprey. But now tilt rotors are re-emerging for military and commercial applications, including many concepts for urban air taxis. To explain this resurgence, I'd like to adapt a quote from Igor Sikorsky, the father of the modern helicopter. He once said, if a man is in need of rescue, an airplane can come in and throw flowers on him, and that's just about all. But a helicopter could come in and save his life. But I'd like to add that a tilt rotor can fly to you faster and at a greater range. This is because while a helicopter can cruise at up to 150 knots, tilt rotors, through the use of their airplane mode and offloading the load onto the wings, um, enables them to travel twice as fast. But we want to push that boundary even further with new rotor designs and technologies. However, that doesn't come without its own set of challenges. As I mentioned earlier, the blades are flexible. This is a requirement for rotor control. And so they are under high bending strain from the lift and this is accentuated by having a larger radius than propellers. Due to the cyclic pitch controls, the blades undergo high oscillatory loading, not to mention the uh, combined centrifugal loading from rotating at such high speeds. Ultimately, this leads to aeroelastic stability concerns. The most notable of which is whirl flutter, uh, which is a explosive instability that occurs due to the coupling of the rotor aerodynamic forcing with the elastic wing modes. Uh, and ultimately, this is a key limitation to the forward flight speed. As you increase your forward flight speed, the damping of these wing modes goes uh, negative or decreases until it's positive for a uh, unstable situation. Conventionally, the solution for this was to make the wings stiffer. This leads to a thicker airfoil and therefore more drag. So you can delay whirl flutter to higher speeds, but now you can't reach those speeds due to the drag on the wing. And so a proposed solution is to change the blade dynamics and alter the aerodynamic forcing on the rotor. The coupling of the bending and torsion motion of the rotor blade significantly affects whirl flutter. And since most lift is generated at the tip of the blade, by adding a swept tip, we can introduce aerodynamic and structural couplings. There have been previous numerical studies that indicate a 20 degree sweep of the outer 15 to 20% of the blade uh, have a significant benefit to increasing damping and delaying whirl flutter uh, to speed higher speeds. So the objective of this work is part of a larger program at UMD to develop advanced lightweight tilt rotors that are whirl flutter free up to over 400 knots within with a thin wing and advanced geometry blades and hubs um, through testing at the Lionel Martin window. But that covers the introduction for this talk. Um, next, we'll go over the blade geometry and design before moving into the construction and the uh, properties of that built blade, um, the finite element modeling of the blade, and finally, special considerations that must be uh, made for the swept tip blade. Uh, the blades are designed as a family. There is a straight, untwisted blade which serves as the research baseline for structural measurements and other benchtop tests. A straight, twisted blade which is representative of the current state of the art and serves as a baseline for the wind tunnel tests. Uh, before finally the swept tip blade, um, which is our advanced geometry concept where no blade like this has been built or tested before. 
Each blade has the same uniform cross-section. There is a row cell foam core uh, with tungsten carbide leading edge weights that are non-structural and placed at the leading edge uh, to bring the center of gravity of the blade forward for aerodynamic stability. A 2D spar makes up the main structure of the blade and is built of two plies of plus or minus 45 degree woven carbon fiber prepreg material. Uh, this fabric is IM78552 and is donated by the Boeing Company. Um, lastly, the outer skin is a single ply of the same material. To determine the spar design, a parametric study was performed to determine the total width as well as the number of plies in the spar. These two parameters help us target the normal and cordwise stiffnesses of the blade. And while these blades are meant to be uh, meant for research purposes and therefore not represent a single tilt rotor individually, um, the XV15 scale properties were used as a target to get, guide our design. Here we see the results of the study. Along the x-axis is the width of the spar as a percentage of cord length, and the y-axis are the two bending stiffnesses, normal and cord. Each line represents an increasing number of plies in the spar. And laying over the target properties, uh, we find that while we can accurately select the normal bending stiffness, um, with our material choice, uh, we cannot reach the target cord stiffness of 400 Newton meters squared. This is okay, however, because the dominant motion of the rotor and prop rotor blades is the normal bending due to the lift generation known as flat. And so we selected a design with two plies ending at 33% cord for the final spar geometry. With the design of the blade finalized, we can move to building the blade and performing benchtop tests to measure the properties. The blade starts with the foam core, which is pressed into shape using the outer mold line of the blade. It is cut into two pieces, the aft and the spar core. Um, at this point, the leading edge weights are placed inside of the spar core, and then both cores are wrapped in a film adhesive you see here as a green material. The spar core is then wrapped in two layers of the woven carbon fiber prepreg, and the spar and aft core are then placed together and wrapped tightly in a single layer carbon fiber skin. Um, the blade as a whole is placed into two-part mold, and so the spar and skin are co-cured together in an oven. Once the blade is finished, it is important to understand its physical properties in order to properly model and predict its behavior during the wind tunnel test. This includes both inertial and structural properties. First, in order to ensure there is no imbalance in the rotor, it is critical that all blades balance evenly. Um, this can be adjusted by placing aluminum tape at the tip of the blade, which adds a small amount of weight, uh, but greatly improves um, the center of gravity of the blade pair. Um, and doing so prevents um, any one pair of forcing due to imbalance in the rotation. Once this is done, we can then check the location of the center of gravity of each blade. Um, it must be placed near the aerodynamic center at 25% cord for aerodynamic stability. Um, this is designed by using the leading edge weights, but it's double checked um, by balancing the blade on a knife edge along two separate axes. The intersection of these axes is the center of gravity for the blade. Next, the moment of inertia is required to understand the vibratory response of the blade in flight. This is done by suspending the blade as a pendulum, and then using a laser distance gauge, the period of the pendulum is recorded, and then based on this period, the inertia can be calculated. Subtracting out the measured inertia of the grip alone provides the blade inertia about the hub. For structural measurements, the blade stiffness in bending and torsion, referred to as the EIs and GJ, are important for predicting the rotor performance in flight. For GJ, a mirror is placed on the blade and a torque load applied. A laser shines onto the mirror and reflects onto a grid. The displacement of the laser on that grid provides the angular def deflection, which is used for calculating the GJ. A similar method could be used for the bending stiffness, EI. However, more care is required for this measurement. Instead, Accelerometers are placed on the blade in two separate stations. Under static conditions, the accelerometer output outputs a 1G signal. As the blade bends, the accelerometer rotates, and the 1G signal is divided between the Z and Y axes, allowing us to back out the orientation. As we apply a tip load, 
The accelerometers can read the y and z axis bending slopes, which we can then use to extract the EI. Um, this method enables faster and more robust measurements without sacrificing any accuracy. But since this is a new type of measurement, it was first validated on aluminum beam. Uh, with a one inch by quarter inch cross section, it has a theoretical EI of 37.8 newton meters squared. In the graph on the left, uh, we see the results of three trials overlaid on top of each other, uh, which shows good repeatability between these tests. Um, these represent the bending slope of the accelerometer placed near the tip, as well as near the root. Um, it's difficult to see, but each data point also includes 95% confidence intervals. Taking a closer look at the confidence band, uh, we can see it is relatively constant across each test, indicating that the error is only due to electrical noise in the accelerometer. Now, by fitting a line through these two curves and taking the slopes, uh, we can then back out the EI for the aluminum beam as measured. And we see that it agrees well uh, with the theoretical value. So now with this method validated, uh, we moved on to measuring the straight untwisted blade for the structural uh, baseline. And here's a sample result uh, for that test. We see the same overlay of the trials and a small 95% confidence intervals um, as we saw with the previous validation case on the beam. And now again, using the slopes of the two measurements, uh, we calculate the EI in the normal bending, in the normal bending direction to be 20.1 newton meter squared, up to a very high accuracy. We can do the same thing with the bending in the cordwise direction. Here you can see a bit more scatter in each trial because the blade is nearly 10 times stiffer in the cordwise direction, and so the noise plays a larger role. Despite this, we still measure the EI to be quite close to the design value, and we find that the measured properties don't deviate from what the blade was designed to be. With the blades fully characterized with respect to the design values, we also built a high fidelity finite element model of the blades to accurately predict the behavior during testing. The model starts in CATIA, including each subcomponent of the blade, and then is meshed in qubit. Uh, each mesh used over 25,000 nodes. nodes. Um, and in the bottom image here, you can see each zone here represents a different segment of the blade, um, accounting for how the uh, orientation of the carbon fiber applies change as it twists and wraps around the blade. Um, then this mesh was loaded into X3D and a 3D finite element code designed for comprehensive road analysis. The frequencies can be extracted from the stiffness matrix and then the blade stiffnesses from the static deflections. However, the model is only as accurate as the material properties applied to it. First, using the data sheet properties of, of the provided carbon fiber fabric, the model frequencies of the model clamped frequencies were compared to the measured frequencies of the blade. We can see the data sheet properties greatly over predict the frequencies, uh, indicating the fabricated blade is less stiff than the data sheet would suggest. Since composite material properties can vary depending on the fabrication process, we performed a series of coupon tests to determine the correct properties to be used in our model. This was done using a four point bending test of coupons from the same pre prepared fabric in different orientations. The four point bending creates an area of constant bending moment where strain gauges can measure the resulting strain in the coupon to back out each material property. Each test allowed for the measurement of the longitudinal and lateral Young's modulus, the shear modulus, and the Poisson ratio. And we find that the Young's modulus is measured to be lower than the data sheet value, in addition to properties not listed on the material data sheet. Now these updated properties are then used in the X3D model. With the new properties, but we see that while X3D now underpredicts the measurement, the error is greatly reduced. In order to further refine the model, the properties were slightly tweaked, um, varying both the shear modulus and the push-on ratio uh, in an attempt to try to improve the correlation. It was found that while slight, still slightly overpredicted, um, increasing the shear modulus by 50% provided the best correlation with the measured blade. And so now with the measured material properties finalized, we can compare the sectional stiffness properties between the model and the measured blade. Here we have the measured stiffness for the blade and the scaled XV15 properties used as a guide for the design. The Y axis is normal bending and X axis is the span of the blade. 
While the XV15 blades had spanwise variations along the blade, these blades have a uniform cross section uh, and therefore constant properties. And we can see that as designed, we match well with the target normal bending stiffness. Now with this graph, we can compare the X3D model for the straight, untwisted blade. As expected from the frequencies, the model slightly over predicts the EI as well. This is within the variance, though, uh, expected from composite blade fabrication. And knowing that our model correlates well with the straight, untwisted blade, but we also have the twisted blade to ensure the same properties. And again, we can see the uniform distribution of normal stiffness that lines up with, well with the previous predictions and the measurement. In the same way, we can look at the cord-wise stiffness. As a reminder, the designed cord stiffness is not the same as the scaled X215 properties, um, but it is there as a reference. Comparing the two X3D models, uh, we see that the cord stiffness is again well predicted. Uh, the waves you see are due to the modeling of the leading edge weights. There are seven of them along the blade. And while they're designed to be non-structural, their 2.5 inch length does provide some additional stiffness. Um, but overall, we see good correlation between the measured properties and the model blade. And here we see a total overall summary of the blade inertial and structural properties. And these results show that we now have a physical set of blades which have been characterized in an accurate finite element model for the twisted and untwisted blades. With this, we move on to the swept tip blade. Building this blade requires special considerations for ensuring the strength of the blade to hold the centrifugal as well as lifting forces during flight. The first issue is that the spar will not cover the full length of the blade. For our purposes, ending the spar at 80% span where the sweep starts um, provides sufficient strength so, so that extra steps aren't necessary. But in the event that our results show extending the spar is necessary for the structural or dynamic benefits that might delay war flutter, um, there are options of varying complexity, including extending the spar um, straight until it reaches the edge of the blade um, or sweeping the spar, which adds um, additional complexity that we get into with wrapping the carbon fiber. This is the second and more important issue to address. It is impossible to smoothly wrap a fabric around the airfoil and the sweep simultaneously. Um, there must be a cut in the fabric uh, and something to cover the seam. And there are two options for placing this cut. The first doesn't cut any radial fibers, uh, so the fabric is continuous from root to tip. However, in the swept region, the layup has changed due to the rotation of the beam axis. It's no longer a balanced plus minus 45, um, but now in reference to the local cords section, it is plus 25 minus 65, giving us an unbalanced layer. An alternative to this is to place a notch in the material and wrap each piece along the straight and swept portions individually. This ensures a balanced layup on the tip, um, but requires reinforcement of the joint where the sweep starts to ensure load transfer between the two sections. In practice, this is done by placing an additional strap over the seam before the skin is cured. First, the fabric is cut to shape using a template. Then the swept tip is rotated to maintain the plus minus 45 degree layup and wrapped around the tip. An additional strap is then placed over the seam to create a lap joint and ensure proper load transfer uh, between the swept and straight portions of the blade. And now at this stage, um, all swept blades are built and ready for testing. So in summary, this work describes the building of a set of prop rotor blades for scale model wind tunnel testing. After the structure was designed through 2D analysis, the actual blade properties were carefully measured and modeled in 3D finite element analysis. We were doing this while ensuring the models match the measured blade required coupon testing to ensure the most accurate material properties were used for the carbon fiber, spar, and skin. With this knowledge, uh, we now have the first generation of swept tip blades fabricated and ready for wind tunnel entry as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention. And at this point, I'd open it up for questions. Um, but instead, you are welcome to reach out to me via email, which is located at the bottom of this slide. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or comments you may have. Um, but with that, uh, this concludes the presentation. Thank you for your time.